All right. Perfect. So hi, everyone. Welcome to our third session of uh, the Maine 2020 Educational Day. Um, I'm especially delighted that today we're able to welcome Dr. Doina Prekup. So Dr. Prekup is an associate professor in the School of Computer Science at McGill University. She obtained her bachelor's of engineering degree um, yeah, <laughs> from the Technical University of Cluj, Napoca, Romania, and her master's and PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she was a Fulbright Fellow. Her research interests are in the areas of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and applications of these methods to real world problems. She received a number of awards, including the Creative Destruction Lab Ideas Award and the Google Focus Research Award. And I'm delighted that she's here today to tell us a little bit about the introduction and introduction to reinforcement learning. And with that, I'll let you take it away, Dr. Prekup. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I, I will do a brief introduction to reinforcement learning. It's a very broad topic, so I'll do my best to kind of condense the main ideas uh, here. Um, reinforcement learning uh, is really very much inspired by I'm a learning uh, theory. And uh, so, you know, in I'm learning, you might have a little mouse like the one in the figure uh, that is learning to solve a task, for example, to press a, a sequence of levers. And in order to signal to the animal that the task has been achieved, there is a reward signal, for example, some food that the animal receives. And so the same idea uh, is used for reinforcement learning agents. We uh, embed such agents in an environment. Uh, this could be a simulated physical world or a game or uh, the Internet um, or, uh, you know, this, the agent could be a robot in the real world. Um, and this agent can perceive the state of the environment, uh, for example, by using cameras, proprioception, sensors, and so on. It's allowed to take actions in the environment, and as a result, it uh, receives numerical rewards. And the goal of this agent is going to be the, to maximize the total reward uh, received over time. So that is the basic idea. Um, really, uh, the, the field ha has developed at the intersection of uh, many different fields like uh, com computer science, but also neuroscience and psychology, optimal control theory from engineering, uh, as well as ideas from uh, economics and operations research. Um, and so I'm going to talk about reinforcement learning agents, but uh, all of these algorithms actually are, of course, machine learning algorithms. And in machine learning, the main idea is that you uh, drive uh, an agent or a predictor to minimize some form of error, typically a prediction error. And so in reinforcement learning, uh, we're going to look at a particular kind of prediction, which is this expected future cumulative reward. And uh, the main thing that we're going to emphasize is that the agent should construct predictions that are self-consistent over time. Um, and so, for example, uh, if I predict something at the current time step, uh, one time step later, uh, my prediction uh, should still hold true. So, for example, if I predict that I would have gotten a cookie, then either I get the cookie on the next time step, or if not, I should still expect to get a cookie uh, following that. And there are going to be errors that are computed between these predictions made at consecutive time steps, and that's the error signal that's going to drive the agent. So that drives the predictions. Now, what about the action choices? We're going to use a very simple idea here, which is that if a situation has proved since the last time step, last action we took should be emphasized, should be taken more often. Uh, and so that's going to shape uh, the probabilities of taking different actions. Um, and so this is just to uh, kind of um, put together uh, these concepts. We're going to consider this agent. For simplicity, we're going to consider a discrete time scale. So at every time step, the agent looks at the environment. We're going to call its perception the state of the environment. Based on this perception, it can choose an action. As a response, it's going to receive a numerical reward, and the environment is going to transition to another state. And so the goal of this agent is going to be to find a policy that is a mapping from states to actions that maximizes its, its long-term uh, expected uh, sum of rewards, which we call a return. Now, there's one example uh, that my colleagues at DeepMind uh, developed about uh, four or five years ago now uh, called AlphaGo that's been often used as a successful uh, example of reinforcement learning. Um, 
uh, the idea here is that you have an agent that learns to play this this game. It's a perfect information game. Uh, so the agent sees the state of the board. On the board, you have white and black pieces. The agent controls one set of pieces, so they see the white pieces. Um, and the actions that the agent is allowed to do is to pick uh, legal moves with these pieces. Now, interestingly, the reward for this task uh, is really whether you win or you lose the game. And so there's just going to be one reward that the agent receives at the end of the game, which is either plus one or minus one. And this is in contrast, for example, with let's say supervised approaches to the same problem where uh, an agent might be told at every step by an expert, you've done the right thing or you haven't done the right thing. In this case, the, the reward signal is very much delayed from the time when a good or a bad action uh, might have happened. And so uh, the agent is going to need to acquire data in order to understand this delayed connection between the reward and, and the action that have been taken. And uh, so now we have to acquire data. How do we do that? Well, one way to do it is by allowing this agent to play games against itself. Um, and uh, this seems uh, like a little bit of a strange uh, idea. Of course, if you play against yourself, uh, one advantage is that you can play lots and lots and lots of games because you don't depend on a person uh, to be in the loop. Uh, but also you're always playing against a matched opponent. And so if we randomize the agents a little bit, they're always going to play new games. And uh, both copies of the agent are going to get information. One of them wins, the other one loses. In either case, we have a reward signal, and this reward signal is going to get propagated to the trajectory that came before. And so the agents are both going to learn to predict what's the likelihood or, of a win or a loss at the end of the game. And also, um, the, the agent that wins is going to slightly increase the probability of taking the actions that have been seen during the game the losing agent is going to slightly decrease the probability of these actions. Because these agents train by themselves without uh, human uh, input or trying to uh, sort of mimic an expert, they actually are able to invent new playing uh, that are in fact superior to the ways that people play. And that's one of the exciting features of reinforcement learning agents, this ability to go uh, beyond uh, what a teacher might know about a task. Okay, so now we're going to look a little bit at the details of these algorithms. There's going to be a little bit of math that we're going to look at to, to see what the update rules for these agents look like. We're going to imagine this agent being in its environment of observing a state ST means the state at time step T. The agent can take then an action. So AT is the action chosen by the agent at time step T and RT denotes the reward uh, that is being received. And the sequence of states, actions, and rewards that the agent sees is going to be called a trajectory. And this trajectory might terminate, for example, in the case of a game, we win or we lose, that ends the game. Um, or we can even think about trajectories that are continuing over time. Now, what is the, the ag agent going to measure? The agent is going to measure return. That is a measure of its future cumulative reward. And so what this means is the agent is going to consider a sum of rewards that it might receive over time. But typically, we're going to also use a discount factor in order to devalue rewards that are received further into the future. And so for example, uh, if I get a cookie tomorrow, it's a bit less good than if I receive a cookie today. And you know, the intuition comes, for example, from, uh, let's say, inflation rates where uh, these rewards perhaps degrade over time. One way to think about this is to think of gamma as the probability of the agent continuing on its trajectory. If it continues on its trajectory, it continues to accumulate rewards, and otherwise there's no more reward after that, and otherwise the reward is zero. Now, what is the value function? The value function is the expectation of the return taken over some way of behaving of the agent and taken over the environment. Now, the environment is not necessarily known to the agent. And so really what we're going to focus on is the policy, so the way of choosing actions, which is under the agent's control. And this value function uh, is going to tell us how good we expect this current policy to be. And our goal 
is going to, to be to improve the policy over time as much as possible. So we're building these expectations, uh, but then we're going to actually use them to drive the agent's behavior. How do we build such an expectation? Well, the simplest idea is what's called Monte Carlo. And uh, Monte Carlo basically says we're going to uh, estimate this expectation by taking samples of it. In other words, taking samples of returns on particular paths that the agent does and averaging them in to compute the estimated value function. And so you can imagine an agent sitting at state SD and you can imagine the set of all possible trajectories that this agent could have in its environment. In this particular case, we're assuming that the environment has a finite number of states and it has the agent has a finite number of actions. The empty circles represent states in the picture. The black uh, dots represent action choices. And so uh, in this case, the agent goes down a particular path, this red path that you see in the figure, and the agent is going to accumulate all of the rewards that are received on this path. And uh, that's going to be a sample of its return. And now it can update its estimated value function towards the sample. And towards the sample means we're going to use a learning or step size parameter alpha. That's a number between zero and one that we're going to choose that tells us how much we trust this new sample uh, compared to the previous average. Okay. Now, notice that if we do this, uh, you know, we can always imagine an agent doing this kind of operation, doing a full trajectory, taking the return and averaging it in. Um, and notice also that we can, in fact, update all of the states that happen on this trajectory with a return that, that followed them. And so in the case of Go, the equivalent way to think about it is the agent is going to play a full game, observe the outcome, whether it's won or it's lost, and then update all of the state action pairs or all of the states that have happened on that trajectory towards uh, the outcome, right? So either increase their value if the outcome was a plus one or decrease their value if the outcome was a minus one. And we can always do this, but in order to do an update, we need to wait until the end of the game. And so a lot of what we're gonna talk about is methods that try to do these updates a little bit faster that don't necessarily require the agent to wait until the end of the game. We can assume that the environment has more structure and typically this structure is called a Markov decision process. Uh, what this means is that we assume that the next state and reward that the agent will see only depend on the current state and action and not the past history that preceded them. This is the Markovian property. Um, you can think of this as an assumption or you can think of this as a requirement that anything that matters to the agent should be part of its current state. In other words, the agent might need to remember things that have happened further in the past. And so, so long as the agent remembers them, they're part of its current state. And so the Markovian property is going to be satisfied. In a Markovian environment, the environment is fully described by uh, the next reward uh, and the next state distribution. This is a joint distribution and it's conditioned only on the current state and the current action. And so, for example, what this means in the game of Go is that if we look at the board uh, and we consider different actions, that is sufficient information for us to, to predict a distribution over uh, the next uh, time step reward and over next states that we might be in. Now, the fact that we have a distribution means that we're not predicting just one thing, right? We're, we're predicting a, a stochastic uh, transition. And so there can be, of course, uncertainty in the environment. For example, in the game of Go, um, the opponent has a policy and we might um, not know what that policy is. So this kind of uncertainty would be captured in this model. If we have Markovian structure, we can do something slightly smarter uh, than Monte Carlo by observing the fact that the return that an agent has decomposes uh, recursively. So the return GT of the agent at time step T can be expressed as a sum between the immediate reward RT plus one and the return obtained from time T plus one onwards, discounted appropriately. And so we can then write the value function as an expectation over this sum, and we can use linearity of the expectation to decompose it. 
Um, and this is going to uh, lead us to a structure called a Bellman equation. And the details here are not important. Main thing to notice is that we're expressing the value function of state S as a function of the values of the following states S prime. So we have this kind of uh, recursive object that we can now uh, hope to compute. So I'm going to just show you a picture to kind of contrast what this looks like compared to Monte Carlo. Okay. So if you imagine again the agent sitting at top of this tree of all possible trajectories, it's sitting at state ST. The dynamic programming computation uh, is a breadth first computation. Okay. So it looks at all the possible actions that the agents could take. It looks at all the possible next states weighted by the probability of their occurrence. Um, and that it does an averaging for the value of state ST based on all of the values at the following states. Um, and so now we can repeat this process. If the agent picks an action, it arrives at a new state, it will again look at the entire tree that's under that site, but only one level deep. Now, of course, you can notice that if we're going to have lots of states and lots of actions, this is going to potentially be a very big computation. And this is one of the main drawbacks of dynamic programming. It does not scale well with the size of the environment. Um, and the trade-off between dynamic programming and Monte Carlo is almost like the trade-off between breadth-first methods and depth-first methods uh, in computer science. How do we combine these ideas? Well, one way to combine them is by essentially taking the intersection of this big uh, sort of slice at the top and one particular trajectory through the tree. And so what this means is that we might consider just uh, sitting at state ST, picking some particular action, and then observing the immediate next state, and considering that the value that we currently have for the state is a good estimate of what would happen from then on. Okay, in other words, the value of ST plus one, V of ST plus one is summarizing everything that happens in the trajectory tree under uh, ST plus one. And so with this, we can now uh, sort of uh, imagine doing these updates at every time step as the agent goes through its trajectory. And again, we have here the learning rate alpha, which uh, is a number between zero and one, like before, like in the Monte Carlo case. Uh, and it tells us how much emphasis to put on this particular return sample uh, compared to the previous ones. Now, if you look at this equation, there's something a little bit peculiar about it, which is that the agent is using its current guess for the value function in order to uh, provide itself a target. And you might imagine that this problem could be uh, bad, you know, that we might have bad estimates of the value function, and maybe this will uh, lead the agent to do sort of erroneous updates. The nice thing about these algorithms is that, of course, the value function gets better over time because there are ground truth rewards that are coming in. There are real transitions that are coming in. And as the agent's value estimates get better, they this these uh, this quality uh, propagates at all states, like in dynamic programming. So this is the basic idea behind temporal difference learning methods, which were first introduced by Rich Sutton back in 1988. They're one of the cornerstones uh, ideas of reinforcement learning. And so in, in temporal difference learning, we're going to consider the value estimate at time step t via SD. We're going to consider the value estimate one time step later at time step t plus one. Uh, that's the reward plus gamma times the value of the next state. And then we're going to compute the temporal difference error. That's the error between these two estimates. And so if the agent were to be self-consistent, uh, in expectation, this error should be zero because it's uh, predictions at the current time step and ne next time step should uh, should be in expectation equal to each other. But as the agent is learning, of course, they're going to have non-zero signal here, and that's going to drive updates to the value function. Now, the value update that I write here on the slide uh, is assuming now that the agent has some kind of function approximator in order to represent its value function. This could be a linear approximator, or maybe it could be a neural network or, or some other gadget which is parameterized by a parameter vector w. And so what we're going to do is take this parameter vector w at time step t and correct it in the direction that minimizes the temporal difference error delta t. Um, and we're going to uh, use also the gradient 
uh, in order to propagate this temporal difference error over all of the parameters in the function approximator. So, in other words, what we're doing here is we're pretending that the temporal difference error is like a supervised learning error and using uh, gradient descent or, or uh, you know, backpropagation, which is a version of gradient descent for neural networks, in order to uh, put this error, assign this error to different parameters. Um, Schultz, Diane, and Montague have showed that the STD errors are actually a, a very good uh, computational account of the activity of uh, dopamine neurons in the brain. This is something that may be familiar to uh, people in the neuroscience literature. Um, and I'm not really going to have much time to talk about this, uh, but the basic idea is uh, that um, if you observe the activity of several dopamine neurons, these are uh, represented as dots uh, in these lines in the figure, um, the TD errors would basically say that if a reward happens unexpectedly without any uh, stimulus or the animal being conditioned, you're going to see uh, a spike in dopamine. Uh, and this is a sort of uh, both predicted by the model and corroborated in, in the biological activity of these neurons. But if we actually do uh, conditioning for an animal, so there's a stimulus followed by a reward, then the temporal difference error uh, happens at the time of the stimulus. So whenever the animal observes the stimulus, there's a bell or something like this, it anticipates the reward happening. And so the activity of dopamine is going to reflect that at the time of the stimulus and not at the time of, at the, time of the reward. This is exactly what the TDA would predict. And then in the bottom row, if the reward actually does not happen as anticipated, at that point in time, we're going to see a negative TDR because we were expecting a reward. We got less than expected. Okay, so that causes a, a negative TDR, and that's exactly what the uh, TD algorithm would predict. There's been lots and lots of follow-up work uh, on this model in the in the neuroscience and psychology literature, of course. Okay, so now. Um, I'm going to show you various computational ideas that uh, can be added on top of temporal difference learning in order to uh, improve its uh, performance. The first one is to use multi-step backups. And so the basic idea here is that rather than the agent looking at just over one time step, taking the immediate reward and the value of the next step, it could actually look over some number of time steps uh, and take uh, the values uh, at the end of that. And so uh, if we do this to infinity, we would actually get Monte Carlo methods. But if we do this after, let's say, two steps or three steps, one way to think about, about this is that we're going to have a trade-off between bias and variance. Now, why is this? Well, if you imagine an agent playing very long trajectories, like game of Go, you know, there will be some good trajectories and some bad trajectories. If we take all of the returns, the variance over these returns tends to be high. Okay. But at the same time, you know, if you have a return, you know the ground truth, you know what actually happened during the game. And so your samples are, are unbiased. You're not using, for example, your own value function uh, in order to uh, provide any estimates. However, if we're looking at one time step, our estimate is actually. Uh, polluted in some sense by the value that we uh, have for the next state. And so that introduces uh, some bias, but that bias, you know, in the limit will wash away under certain theoretical circumstances. But in the short term, we're introducing a bias. At the same time, there's intuitively less variability over one time step than there may be over an entire trajectory. So typically the variance uh, is lower for these algorithms. Now, there's a further uh, idea that we can use called eligibility traces, which is rather than committing of a, of a time horizon, one or two or three steps over which we're going to do updates, we can consider all of the returns uh, weighted uh, exponentially uh, with a parameter lambda that controls this kind of weighting. And the reason to introduce this is really uh, sort of computational, uh, it's a computational reason that this kind of uh, return can, in fact, be uh, updated and uh, TDRs uh, can be propagated at every time step in an agent's trajectory. And so uh, without going into too much detail into this, I just want to emphasize uh, this sort of uh, implementation of eligibility traces, which is the backward view. So the idea is 
you have, uh, you're sitting at time step ST plus one, and you've observed a TD error, delta T. And so you can imagine uh, this error being sort of shouted back in time um, to all of the states that have preceded the current transition. Um, and, uh, you know, like with sound, if the sta a state is very far in the past and maybe it does not get assigned very much of this error. And so we're going to have a decay of, of gamma lambda uh, that, that applies to states uh, in the past. And otherwise, uh, states are going to be updated uh, with respect to, uh, to the current error. And so the eligibility trace is going to be sort of accumulating the gradients and decaying them appropriately. Um, and again, there are some interesting connections in the neuroscience literature uh, that show somewhat similar mechanisms uh, happening uh, in, in certain kinds of neurons. Now, you know, the, for us computationally, one of the interesting things about eligibility traces is that this parameter lambda actually gives us a way to interpolate be between temporal difference learning and Monte Carlo methods. And so lambda equals zero actually gives us directly uh, TD zero, temporal difference learning methods for one step. And lambda equal to one is equivalent in expectation to Monte Carlo methods. And so now we have a knob basically that we can turn in between these two extremes. And so this is just a picture of all of the uh, space of algorithms that we've talked about so far, where we can consider Monte Carlo, which is this sort of depth first one trajectory view we can consider dynamic programming, which does very wide, very shallow backups in terms of computing values and temporal difference learning, which is sort of the intersection of this, which does a narrow and short backup, but uh, over time uh, converges uh, in the limit to the, to the correct value function, assuming that we have a, a tabular environment. And of course, you know, there's another corner we didn't really talk about, which is exhaustive search going full depth and full breadth, but that is uh, much too inefficient and therefore we can't really consider it in any sizable environment. So now I want to talk a little bit about the control problem. What we talked about is value estimation. We're given a policy. We want to estimate the value function for this policy. But what if what we're after is really the optimal policy, the best way of behaving? And um, this is really the crux of reinforcement learning, taking trajectories and uh, estimating uh, the optimal policy from these trajectories. Now, Bellman uh, has shown back in the mid 50s that in a finite Markov decision process, there is actually a, a unique optimal value function and it has at least one corresponding optimal policy. And so the optimal value function is just gonna be a max over all policies for the value of this policy. In order to compute a good policy, however, we, it might be helpful to think not over just states, but over state action pairs. And so this is the optimal action value function denoted by Q star. It's, um, it's uh, the max over policies of the expectation of returns conditioned on not just the state, but the state and the action. So what does this mean? It means that we imagine an agent sitting at a state it's allowed at the very first time step to consider different actions, but then it considers its current way of behaving to be uh, sort of following this first different choice. Okay. And so the following actions are drawn from the agent's current policy. Um, we can actually compute uh, optimal value functions, but using an iterative process. I'm really not going to go into the details of this, except to highlight the fact that this process relies on having a model. So knowing what the expected next rewards are going to be and knowing the uh, transition probability over next states. And um, in general, we can turn this kind of update into an iterative uh, update by uh, making a guess about the current value function and then using this iteration uh, in order to update it. And this is what sometimes people call planning and sometimes people call this model-based methods because they require the use of a model in order to compute then a value function and a policy. And so this is just to give you a depiction, a visual depiction of what this looks like. Imagine that you have an agent that moves around in a little maze. So each of these squares is a state in the maze and the actions are up, down, left, and right. And actually the actions are unreliable. So 30% of the time you don't end up in the intended cell, but a random neighboring cell. 
and then we're going to have a discount here because we want the agent to be encouraged to reach a particular goal state as soon as possible. And the goal state is marked with this big uh, black dot. And so the agent doesn't receive any rewards. Reward is all zero until it enters the goal state at which point it receives a reward of one. Its quarant episode terminates and then the agent is plunked back in some random state in the environment and has to find its way to the goal again. And let's assume that we know for a moment the model. Okay, so we're going to do this very iteration process. What does this mean? Well, we have in the first iteration value being all zero everywhere except at the goal state, which we know we have value of one. And then as the agent is computing over the iterations, the value propagates away from the goal state and fills the environment. Okay. And so in the first iteration, the states that are next to the goal are going to get some value, some non zero value, because they know that they can transition into the goal state. In the next iteration, the states that are two steps away are going to get some value and so on. So you can see that this process is eventually going to propagate the reward to the entire environment, but this might actually uh, take quite a while depending on what the size of the environment is. Um, now, in the, in the previous example, we observed that the model is given. What happens if the model is not given? Well, we could estimate this model from samples. And so P hat here denotes an estimated model. This is a very well understood problem. It's really supervised learning. We can do maximum likelihood estimation and, and update this. And then we can do value iteration with an approximate model. This is what people usually call model-based reinforcement learning. The main problem, like I mentioned, is that if we have a very large environment, we're going to have uh, what Bellman called the curse of dimensionality, right? So that means that we have lots of states and lots of actions and doing summations over all states and maxing over all actions really may be impossible for the agent. And so, for example, the, in the game of Go, there's really 10 to the power 170 states. And uh, the action space is very large. Uh, there are many hundred choices at every step. And so we really cannot uh, actually uh, manage this kind of algorithm. We do need to, to do some kind of sampling in order to avoid this um, computing uh, full summations over all states, expectations over all states. And we also want to use function approximation in order to take information from stem states and propagate it to other related states. And so this leads us to model free value based reinforcement learning methods, which estimate directly a value function without going through a model. Typically, they will estimate a Q function and then the policy of, of the agent is simply greedy with respect to this Q function. Now, if we're going to do this, one important aspect is that the agent has to uh, figure out where interesting things are in the environment. And so, for example, in this picture here, you might have a diver that starts from a boat and needs to go to the bottom of the sea because it's trying to find a treasure, but doesn't really know if there's any treasure there, where it is, or if maybe there's going to be something bad that it discovers, like an unexploded World War II bomb. Um, and so what does the agent need to do? It needs to uh, both do good actions, right? Because it wants, for example, to survive and not drown, but also it needs to explore. This means it needs to try some actions that uh, it doesn't know very much about and currently are not estimated to be optimal. And so that's a trade-off that is really uh, very important for reinforcement learning agents. There are many different exploration methods that have been studied. A lot of the time, what we do is simple randomization, just adding some noise to the policy. Uh, one interesting approach is optimism in the face of uncertainty, which means that the agent will uh, prefer to take actions with high uncertainty because that uh, leads to uh, high learning. Thompson sampling is very popular. It's a probability matching technique where the agent estimates the probability of each action being the best and then picks an action according to that probability. And then there are fancier methods like, for example, the agent deliberately planning to explore, um, which is very intensive computationally, but can lead uh, to better sample efficiency. Um, now, uh, another version of an algorithm is what's called SARSA on policy learning. Here, uh, we're going to learn the action uh, value function of the current policy, okay? And so the current policy is going to be exploratory, but we're going to do this kind of update that, that you see here on the slide, 
that basically says we're going to move our parameters uh, in the direction of the TDR, but the TDR is computed over the action values uh, and the actions are always taken according to the current randomized policy. Um, okay. Alternatively, we can do what's called Q-learning. So Q-learning is basically an approach that um, allows us um, to, uh, to uh, approximate value iteration over action values by again taking samples and in value iteration we would always consider a dream of doing the best possible thing okay and so if the agent is imagining some particular state in the future it always imagines itself as taking the best possible action in that state and uh, in Q-learning we're just going to turn that into a TD target and then do an update with that value um, and so uh, I'm going to show you an algorithm that relies on Q-learning, uh, but with function approximation, which is called uh, DQ1 or, or uh, double uh, or um, <coughs> deep Q-learning. Um, and so the, the update is going to be a Q-learning update, but we're going to use a function approximator in order to generalize uh, over uh, state and action pairs. Um, and the function approximator that we're going to happen to use is going to be a deep neural network. And uh, the update is just using the TDR over Q values. At the next state, we're using a max. This means we're imagining that at the next state, we will do the best possible thing. Um, and otherwise, is just TD with this particular error function. Now, DQN has led to a really uh, excellent success on Atari games. Uh, and this was one of the things that has brought uh, reinforcement learning again in the limelight of, of uh, attention in AI. In this case, uh, we have an agent that tries to play a game. Uh, the, the agent gets visual input, the screen of the game. It looks at four uh, time slices, past time slices, in order to have some idea of where things are going on the screen. And it has a discrete action space of 18 actions corresponding to positions of a joystick. Um, and the agent can, of course, uh, play these games by itself, exploring, taking randomized actions, and then using Q-learning in order to uh, update the parameters of, uh, of a deep Q network. In this case, the network involves some convolutional layers because we have an image and also some fully connected layers. And its output is the action values for all the 18 actions of the agent. And so this is just a sort of a zoomed in version uh, of this particular uh, network. I don't have very much time, but I briefly wanted to mention that there is another class of uh, algorithms called policy optimization. These uh, algorithms learn the parameters of stochastic policy uh, directly. They update them by gradient descent on the return uh, without actually necessarily using the value function or using the value function only for efficiency purposes. <clears throat> and uh, I just want to show you the kinds of things that can be done with this because I don't really have time to, uh, to cover all of the algorithm. The advantage uh, of, of uh, policy optimization methods is that we can consider very complicated action spaces where doing things like maxing over values is uh, not necessarily feasible. And so, for example, some of my colleagues at DeepMind have trained these policies that actuate um, various kinds of uh, motor systems. In this case, there is something like a little spider, but you can imagine this being done, for example, with humanoid robots as well. And in this particular case, what the agent learns is a deep network, but which actually outputs uh, directly actions. And these actions are drawn from some kind of uh, distribution space, for example, a Gaussian distribution. Um, and the policy is updated in order to maximize the return. So we take the return and then we take a gradient that encourages the agent uh, to move uh, the parameters of the distribution, the mu and sigma in this case, in the direction that optimizes the return. Uh, oftentimes, these methods are used together with a particular form of uh, exploration called entropy regularization. Entropy regularization, basically one way to think about it is that it ensures the fact that your policy does not change too quickly. It, it kind of changes slowly over time so that the data that you've used before um, is not uh, too stale. 
Which one is better, value-based or policy-based methods? Well, both of them can work very well. Oftentimes, value-based is used in discrete action spaces, while policy-based methods are preferred in continuous action spaces. Deep networks are very often used uh, in both uh, of these classes of methods to represent either the value function or the policy. Um, deep networks have been uh, really amazing in terms of allowing us to solve some big problems, but at the same time, they face uh, sometimes issues of stability in the training as well as data efficiency. And so one open problem is how to really shape uh, the function approximators uh, for reinforcement learning agents specifically, and whether ideas that are uh, better than bad propagation would be needed there. So I will stop there. There are many more interesting topics that we could talk about, like model-based deep reinforcement learning. I only showed you model-based uh, sort of uh, dynamic programming with tabular setting, uh, fancier exploration and temporal abstraction. There's lots of links to, to neuroscience and biology, uh, but I will stop there. And if there is time, I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Great, thank you so, so much for that introduction. That was really, really wonderful just to get a sense of all the exciting work in this field and, and all the directions going on. Um, so we do have time maybe for just one question. Um, so from uh, Yannick Hashki, um, and I'm so sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, uh, is asking, isn't the Markov decision process neglecting the fact that some actions only pay off when a number of states follow each other, like a tactical move consists, including a couple of consecutive moves? Okay, so uh, that's a that's an interesting question. So I'll I'll sort of uh, give my interpretation of the question, but Yannick, yeah, please chime in if, uh, if possible if this is not the right interpretation. So the Markov one way to think about it is the Markov assumption is an assumption, if it's not true, uh, we can still run these algorithms that we talk about. And it's just that, you know, from a theoretical point of view, we can't show as many things. But of course, you know, Q-learning is, is often done with function approximation. And in that case, the Markov assumption is in fact violated. So think of this as a sort of a theoretical grounding, but not necessarily something that is, uh, you know, an absolute must for the agent. Secondly, if, for example, uh, you want to think of uh, sequences of actions or chunks of actions uh, and so on, you can actually uh, imagine uh, what's called a semi-Markov decision process where you do something for some period of time and then, uh, you know, a transition happens and there's a Markovian property at the level of that transition, but, but that transition might take a wonderful, uh, might take a, a, a number of, of time steps, okay? And so um, we can actually then work in the same way, construct the same kinds of algorithms at the level of a Markov decision process. This is what is done in, in temporal abstraction. Um, I think in a lot of the literature, the Markov property is emphasized because that's the case that we understand best, but it doesn't have to be. And in fact, it's a very interesting question uh, to think about settings where uh, we don't have the Markov property either because we're doing function approximation or because the environment is partially observable. And then how do we uh, handle that case? And very often what happens uh, is people will try to construct uh, the state or the action sequences in a way that becomes more Markovian. Okay, so for example, in the state, we can have memory that makes everything more Markovian. In the action space, we can actually modify the action space uh, so that, uh, you know, either we string actions together or, or somehow we reshape uh, the, the space of uh, policies that we're thinking about. Perfect. No, that's so interesting. And I, I think a really, like you said, a really, really exciting um, kind of area to think about. Um, okay, so I think that's all the questions we're going to have time for. Um, so I just wanted to let people know. So we, we did start Dr. Precup's talk just a little bit late. So we've also delayed Dr. Irina Risch's talk, which will be next. Um, in the meantime, Gather Town is open right now. If you want a really quick break to wave hello at some friends in a virtual space, um, and we'd encourage you to check that out as well. Or if you'd like to get up, stretch your legs. Um, it's, it's really so difficult having so many wonderful talks one after another. Um, but 
we're really happy to have you all here and to be talking a little bit about neuroai so with that we'll see you in gather town or at the next session with dr Irina Rush.